Um, hey, we're so grateful you're here today. Um, we have a real, ex- uh, just a treat. It's just a delight today, uh, but for real. Um, so if you, many of you maybe not, don't know this, we talked about a little bit how like 23 is a campus of a, of a church in Greeley, 23rd Avenue Church. And so two, two years ago when we moved here, we felt God calling us to plant, this, to plant a church here. And we met this, uh, this just, just incredibly compassionate man. <laughs> Yeah, a lady, his wife. Um, no, we met, we met Dave and Roseanne Sather, and we went over to their house and kind of, kind of share our hearts, and, and it was really uh, just a connection that we made with them. And, and uh, you know, two years later, here we are, a campus of 23, and I uh, just have gotten to be such dear friends with them. And, and, uh, just, and, and not just it's excited what's happened, but more it's exciting about what God's doing in, in Fort Collins and Greeley in our Spanish communities and all over the Front Range. So God has some really cool things in store. Um, but uh, we're really grateful for Dave to be here. Um, he's my boss, so make, make me look good. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Good job, guys. We trained last week for this. Good job. You guys are doing great. <laughs> No, but, but uh, Dave's, Dave, he's, he's my pastor. He's, he's a good friend. And, and Zan, they're such great people. And uh, so Dave's going to come share with us this morning, talk a little bit about what God's doing as a, as a whole and some other things that he has for us. So let's give him a round of applause. Dave Sather. Don't fight the love. Don't fight the love. How are you guys doing? Well, I was trying to figure out what to, how to introduce myself. And because I was actually afraid of what he was going to say. Um, I am a husband to an amazing wife. I am the father of two grown sons now, with 30 and 27. So they beat me up, so I can't talk any smack to them. And any dad that knows that you ever grew up with sons, you know that you would have a tendency to beat them up. And then once they didn't, um, once they grew past, the ability for me to dominate them, you respect them, so I respect them now. I own a crazy dog, a brown lab named Tucker, that, um, want to switch to a handheld? Uh, of residency for residency uh, for my doctorate, so I'm glad I got one more year of school. So all you guys in school this year, it's like, oh, Lord, um, I'm, I'm glad for the countdown. And about five years ago, I began to, to pastor again after about 15 years in cabinet making and, and, and business, and I took over a church called Hope Center in Greeley, Colorado. And at the time, we were... Uh, a small struggling church, and I was tasked with rebranding and beginning again and selling a building and moving in. And now we find ourselves with three congregations, uh, an English and a Spanish in Greeley, and you guys in Fort Collins. And you guys are amazing. And, and, and I, I have two stories I was going to tell. One story is in my notes, and it is an inappropriate story about... Victoria's Secrets and, and me sitting in there, and one is about Aaron and Rachel. <laughs> and I'm torn, actually, because first off, I called him on the way to the airport, I think Monday, right? Or Sunday night. I was like, hey, dude, tell me about Fort Collins. Are they easily offended? Because <laughs> I, know, I know Greeley. Right, I know what I can get away with in Greeley because I've been talking there for, for years, and I know that, oh, yeah, they... What they normally say is, oh, yeah, that's Dave. But I didn't know you guys, and I don't know you guys yet, and I didn't want to offend your sensibilities. I was worried that, you know, because a lot of sometimes church people are kind of uptight, and (laughs) I usually offend people like three or four times in a message. (laughs) And so I thought, well, what can I say? So I had this one story planned out, but then Aaron brought up the time he and I met. And so what he didn't tell you is my response. So I get a call from my boss and says, hey, I got this couple from Dakota that wants to come down and plant a church in Fort Collins. I was like, cool, have fun, love you. Don't bug me about it. I'm in Greeley. 
And he's like, no, they want to meet you. Like, they don't want to meet me. He goes, no, just please talk to them. Be nice and see what you can do. And, and honestly, most of the pastors, the young pastors that I meet, it's really easy because normally I don't like them. And so I can just go, yeah, great, God bless you, f- have fun, go with God. <laughs> and, and so they came over the house, and, and we had hamburgers. And, and I had the, and the idea of, okay, if I don't like them, I can send them on their way. I can talk to my boss and said, I was pastoral, I fed them. I wish them the best, and I could, I could leave them, and, and I was, that was my goal, <laughs> yet I ended up loving these guys, not so much Aaron, <laughs> but, but Rach and the, and the kids, and, and their heart, and their passion for Jesus, and their heart for for what God had called them to and, and Fort Collins. And so they spent the next 18 months with us. And we began to be friends. And we began to see the, the hand of God, on, not only on the life of a church that was coming out of the doldrums, but what God had orchestrated that, that nobody could have envisioned. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about this morning. The idea that, that we find our purpose in, in something greater than ourselves. Right? And, and, and if there's anything about 23 that I want to talk to you about this morning, it's not just simply for Collins or Greeley. It's, it's not simply me as a, a pastor over there, you guys as pastors and congregation here. It's what God has in store for all of us. Now, what I believe is that God calls us to something greater than what we ourselves as individuals can accomplish. And that God desires a a healthy, vibrant church that is able to connect the community it's a part of with the Christ that we all love. And so what happens here looks different and smells different than what happens in Greeley, figuratively and literally. But what God has in store here is as great of a part of what God wants to do for us all. So thank you for having us. Why don't we pray? Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for what you are doing here. I thank you for the heart of these people. I thank you for their joy and their laughter. I thank you, God, for the love that they share for one another. And the call of God you have placed on the individual and corporately on the church and then on the whole is 23. I pray, God, that we would be bold in, in what you've called us to. I pray that you would equip us for the task at hand. And God, I pray that you would show us as individuals that we are part of something greater uh, that, that we ourselves can see or imagine. I pray this in your name. Amen. So I'll come back next time and I'll tell you the Victoria's Secret story. One of my most favorite books is is a book called Man's Search for Meaning by a gentleman named Viktor Frankl, written in the 1960s. He was a psychiatrist. He was also uh, a survivor of Nazi Germany. And in Nazi Germany, he lost both of his parents and his wife to the concentration camps. And in the book, he talks about a theory of of psychology, but in the beginning, he tells of a story... um, of what they endured. And he, t- and he talks about one thing. He said that, that in the camps, in the houses where they kept the prisoners, he says you would always wake up and you would notice one thing, and you would notice what it was when someone gave up. And he says when someone gave up, they would not get out of bed. And, and, and if you were a prisoner during that time, if you didn't get out of bed, you knew you were going to be beaten within an inch of your life and, to get out and go back to work. And, and so the prisoners, when they saw one of their compatriots in the rack and not willing to move and just pulled the blanket up, whatever they had, and just laid there, they would go, come on, you got to get up. And they knew it was a lost cause when the, the individual reached down and grabbed his smoke, grabbed a cigarette, and lit it up. 
He says, because if they lit up the cigarette, they knew that there was no talking, that they had given up on life. That if they were laying in bed, no matter what the guy said, no matter how extreme the beating was going to be, no matter what the guard did to them, they had lost meaning in their life. And he quotes Nietzsche, which I know is kind of a crazy guy to quote in church, but, but the quote's profound. It says, Nietzsche wrote that if you give a man a why to live, he can endure almost any how. And it's a profound book. And, and, I, and I thought this morning in, in worship and, and everything else, I was like, that's what we as a church are. Because we as individuals, no matter what stage of life we're in, whether we're at CSU going to school, whether we're a young couple trying to figure out life together, whether we are established or whether we are retired, all of us strive to find some sort of meaning and purpose in our life. No matter where we're at, no matter even our faith and where we are on the spectrum of faith, whether we think Christianity is a crock or whether we have a personal relationship with Jesus, each one of us search and desire to find meaning. For most of us, we have found in our lives times where we search everything other than God. Right? We've gone through life and we walk through college and hit the bars or we dive into relationship after relationship or we find ourselves in addiction or we pour ourselves into a career to find some semblance of of definition of what life is and what life should be about. And and there's a guy in Scripture that that I am intrigued by. The wealthiest man that ever lived. Scholars tell us that he was worth, in today's numbers, $2.1 trillion. Guy had bank. Give you a perspective. The owner of Amazon... Bezos is worth $90 billion. So this guy could buy him 20 times over. So he had everything that, quote, society would say. And he writes this in Ecclesiastes 2, 10 and 11. It says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. And he writes this in verse 17. He says, so I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And I love Scripture. I love scripture because it's honest, right? Sometimes if we're unfamiliar with Christianity or we have kind of a a token understanding of of faith or the Bible, we picture scripture as something that is sterile and, and pie in the sky. And yet we read a guy that had everything, had everything that his hands could and his eyes could want, he could buy and take. Solomon was the king of Israel. He followed his father, David. He followed during the most prosperous time of Israel. He like had it all. And he chased after everything. And he finds it like, well, that's a waste. And there's a part of me that gets kind of bummed out about that. Because a lot of, you know, part of me who I have, I have been a business owner where I have made money and I have been a laborer where I sat on the line hoping for work and I've been unemployed. I like making money more than I like being unemployed, hypothetically. And there's a lot of the stress that's in my life that's like, man, if I just had a few bucks more, my life would be content and happy. And then I read Solomon, who had a few dollars more than me. He's like, I did everything that I wanted and everything's meaningless. I'm like, well, what do you do with that? If I'm trying to find purpose and society tells me that the way you find purpose is things or relationship or stuff tied to this earth, and yet Solomon, who was the wisest guy, goes, eh, it ain't much. Okay, that's a problem. But then there's another guy who had society 
who had placement in society, placement in culture, who was honored among people, who was learned, who was part of a dominant culture, and, and yet he gave up everything. Right? And scripture tells us that he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was thrown in prison, he was ridiculed. He would eventually be persecuted and put to death for his faith. And he writes this. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And here's where it differs. And we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So one guy has everything and pursues everything and considers his life meaningless. And another guy has been whipped, beaten, and chained, has been thrown in a prison, has been put in a hole, has been ridiculed for his belief, and finds it life phenomenal. One guy has every opportunity to find meaning in his life and doesn't find anything. And another guy is seemingly a cast out of society. And yet, when we read what Paul wrote in the epistles, he is incredibly content. I have learned how to live in plenty and nothing. And in all things, I am content. And tell me if that is not what our world needs today. Man, if you're like me, you get, you get inundated by what the world says and what society tells us and what is posted on social media. It's like you turn on social media and it's like, man, I know this world sucks because I'm reminded of it every single day of every waking moment that I am. And so as society, we, we crave and we hope that we can, we can generate things that give us meaning and give our society hope. And so we march and we vote and we, we post things and we rail against injustice and we pour our lives into work and we pour our lives into this relationship or that relationship. And yet this morning, kind of what I wanted to talk to you about is just what we're about. Is about we find meaning not in the things that we see, but in the things that we can't see. We find hope not in our jobs or political party or cause or social justice issue. We find hope in Jesus. Period. And if you're like me, you've probably lived on both sides of that stick. Right? You've lived chasing the dream that you think will give you the security and the hope and the dreams that, that will bring you and your family contentment. And you've lived on the other side where that's kind of fallen away and all that you have is Christ and you're, you're struggling to pay the bills and the phone and the bill collector's still calling and your friends think you, they bailed on you and yet you find a certain level of peace as Scripture says passes understanding in this relationship that you never find in the security and the success of this world. And so our hope here, what you guys are a part of, is a church that's probably a little too real for some people. Right? We're not polished. He unplugged the fog machines for me, which I appreciate. They have to deal with me as a, I don't even know if I'd call myself a boss. So we're not the sexiest, we're not the most affluent, we're not the most polished, but we love the community that we're in. And what we believe at 23rd Avenue Church is that the hope of humanity is in the Christ that we serve. And no matter where you are in your, in your spectrum, no matter where you are in your political affiliation, no matter where you are in your relationship status, that I'll look you all in the eye and I will partner with Aaron and Abe, who was our Spanish pastor, and say, our hope for you 
is that you have an intimate relationship with Jesus that grounds everything else. And it is in that intimate relationship with Jesus that you find hope and that you find security and that you find contentment. And if I knew you like I know Greeley, I would probably say something like, probably like in Greeley, we won't talk about you because you're, you're better than Greeley. <laughs> you just are. You're west of the tracks. Doesn't smell over here. It's all nice. You got horse tooth. I used to cycle a bunch before I went back to school, so I'd do horse tooth loop. Like, we don't have nothing over there. And I had to take my bike over here to ride. All my friends that rode were over here. And so, but if I, if, if I was with Greeley and I was giving this word, I would know that, that some have been so disappointed because you live here. You live in a world that tells you that if you chase after this, you'll find contentment. And there's a part of your heart that's broken because you've put everything, all the eggs in this basket. You've hoped for everything that is seen. And I know that. That's not a point of judgment. That's just reality. Because what our world, man, this is the bait that our world throws in. And if we're like fish, this is the bait that we normally, oh, that looks good. Because all this is really sort of, this is the sexy quote part of life. This is where the big fat paycheck comes in. This is where the perfect marriage happens. This is where your kids never go astray. This is where your boss is always nice to you and understands that you need a day off. This is where, man, if I just got this person in the office, everything would come together. And I know that. But I also know that the world and everything that it offers is temporal. It's temporary. That all the work that I poured into this side can change at a blink of an eye. I know what it is to be affluent and a business owner and employ 40 people. And I know what it is to auction everything off I've worked for for seven years. I know what it is to have a dream and have that dream shattered because the dream is rooted in the world. And I know what it is to to continue to be drawn back because there's just something in us that, that yearns for this because this I can control. But over here is eternal and stable and consistent. And it's something that I can anchor my butt to. And no matter what comes my way, I can stand here. And when I tie myself to there, I'm lost. Because the storms come, and I'm like, oh, all the friends. And and if we're honest, like how many people, like, oh, there's great friends over here. (laughs) Awesome friends over here. Until it hits the fan, and then you're like, I had friends. I wonder if they lost my number. So as a church, my friends, our heart is not to be showy or to grow one big giant church. It's not to go build a $3 million facility and go, hey, look at us. It's not to, to become rich or famous in the Christian world. Aaron might someday, <laughs> but I won't. I'll tell him, you know, I might might ride on his coattails. I knew you win. I fed you a hamburger. (laughs) But our church is to touch a region for Jesus. And that's what you guys are a part if you count this place home. And if you're here for the first time, I'm sorry that you're having to endure me. He's better. He's nicer. He's more polite. He's everything I am not. You complete me. (laughs) But our heart is to connect this community that you live in, along with the community that I live in, with the Christ that we love. So this morning in Greeley, there's another couple hundred people over there. 
Celebrating the same Jesus that we know love us. That's called us to something greater. You see, each one of us, in my opinion, and society will tell it, or, 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 or scholars, smarter people than me will say, that humanity yearns to be a part of something greater than themselves. Yearns. And sometimes we settle. And this is what I believe we settle for just the stuff that we can grasp because we do not believe that God equips us and believes enough of us enough to be a part of something greater than what we ourselves can contribute to. Like God wouldn't want me a part of something amazing because look at me. Well, I want to tell you as a guy that pastors and a guy that's been on both sides of the track, a guy that's went through a divorce, a guy that's felt like an utter failure, a guy that felt like never again would he do anything more than screw together cabinets for the rest of his life and raise his two boys. That God does believe in you. And our hope is that you invite us as pastors, as leaders of this church, to help you along with that journey. We don't have all the answers because we are as jacked up as you are. We, the only difference is we might know Jesus a little more. So we can tell you the story of going, man, I feel like a failure. Yeah, I've been there. But let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, there's nothing that God has for me. Yeah, I've been there too. God is a God of restoration. Yeah, but my marriage is just messed up. I know, but God restores. Yeah, well, my kids are lost. I know, but God is a father who opens the gate and welcomes us home. That's our church. I'm as much a part of you as you are a part of me. You're not 60 adults. You're part of a church of 400 that has three congregations and two campuses. You're part of what we believe is a movement that is tasked with reaching northern Colorado with an authentic gospel that's maybe a little more too transparent for some. And we're just us. We're people from Dakota that talk weird. <laughs> we're a southern California boy that found himself in Greeley, Colorado, which is confusing. We're a first-generation immigrant from uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, who has a heart for missions. We support a couple from Costa Rica where I'll go and teach uh, 100 pastors in October. We're a church that supports Centennial Elementary, and it's eight languages, and Putnam. That's our church. We're a church that loves kids. Why? Because I value kids because anybody under the age of 12 normally likes me and over the age of 65. <laughs> it's that gap in between 12 and 65 that causes me problems. <laughs> We're a church that believes in cultural expression, and by that what I mean is the reason we don't live stream is because I don't think it's effective. The congregation that I speak to in Greeley is different than you guys. Just like the congregation that's Spanish is different than the congregation that is English, it's different than the congregation in Fort Collins that will be different than the congregation in Johnstown or Windsor or Timnath. That we are one church with a vision and values that is free to be culturally relevant. So the life in Fort Collins is different than the life in Greeley, and so we allow for that and we celebrate that. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having the courage to be a part of something larger than yourself. I think God has some amazing things in store for you. I was, I was sitting there worshiping with Zan. Hey, everybody say, hey, Zan. She's otherwise known as Roseanne, the great one, <laughs> the better half, my wife my hero, um, the one that is, is, has to deal with things like this. Um, but if I get in with this, and then I'll hand it back to you. I 
I was worshiping, and, and y'all need to know this, and I don't know you. And so I, I, I say this respectfully. God loves you. And if you're here, and it, maybe it's the first time in a long time that you're here, and, and you find yourself over here, that's okay. I'm not doing this to you because I've lived here. But I'll tell you that when we have our eyes on the temporal, our impression of life is, is defined by the immediate, which means if I lock myself in here, this is all that I'll ever experience. But God as creator and father I desires so much more for you. So much more than what this is. This ends up smelling like Greeley in 1980. You know, it just stinks after a while. But over here is not easy. I can't lie to you and say, hey, everything's going to be good. Except Jesus, you hit the lotto. Praise God, let's go all buy a ticket. That's a lie. And no pastor that is apart and in relationship with me will ever tell you that. And if he does, call me up. I'll go take him out back. Because life on this side is not like all roses and buttercups, but it is a phenomenal adventure. And it is content. It is satisfying. It brings meaning and joy and happiness and security where all this stuff doesn't. That's a Jesus that we serve. That's a Jesus that we love. I'd love to talk with you. If you have any questions, if you have any complaints, if you have any complaints about Aaron, you can call me. If you have any complaints about me, call Aaron. Um, thank you for being a part of something greater. Can I pray with you? Father, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your word that is true and accurate and honest. And I thank you for the relationship that you offer every single person, every single person here. Father, I pray that, that if there be anybody here that just feels lost, that feels like life is nothing more than a series of events that start and stop, that they're hopeless. God, if there's someone here this morning that finds themselves, like the story that Frankel told, they're in the rack, they're in bed, they don't want to get up, and in fact, they're, they're hypothetically reaching over for that last smoke because there ain't nothing for life. In fact, I, I want to do this for, with everybody's heads bowed and, and eyes closed, and we're going to end real quick. I really think that there's probably one or two of you here that identify with that story. That you know what it is to lay down and not want to get up. And in fact, right now you're laying down and you're contemplating just like I quit. If that's you, I want you to know that God's plan for you is rich. That he doesn't judge you. That he wants to bring you home. That life is more than the sum total of your failures or your disappointments. That He loves you. He loves you. So Father, I say I pray a sense of peace and hope and encouragement. That there is a reason to get out of bed. And I thank you for this dear congregation. I pray that you would continue and complete the work that you have begun, that you would pour out a blessing here and in this community and in this region, that 23 Fort Collins would be a lighthouse in a very real sense, that people would know it not for its show but for its authenticity, that people would understand what it is to be loved and accepted, that they would experience Jesus and that people who find, cannot find a place to call home would find a place here. I thank you for, for Rachel and Aaron and the team here. God, let them know that they're missed, but we are so, so proud. 
of everything you're doing through their lives and their ministries. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Thanks, buddy. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that.